um, uh, open our hearts to listen to your word, speak through your servant, and, and, and show us your will this morning. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Pastor Kelly, all yours. And thank you, Pastor Jeremy. It is so much fun for me to be able to uh, be in your service this morning. And uh, I have enjoyed the opportunities I've had to worship with you in person. And now uh, to get to do it in, uh, uh, through Zoom is, uh, is a real treat for me. And I, I appreciate you um, giving me your kind attention today. And I trust that as we look into the word together that uh, it ministers to your heart in a very special way. Uh, I want to uh, today, uh, today and then again next week, Pastor Jeremy's asked me if I would do two weeks, and so I'm actually going to be looking at two prayers out of the book uh, of Ephesians, and uh, today I'd like for us to look in Ephesians chapter 1, and we're starting in verse 17, and we're going to be looking at a prayer for spiritual wisdom, and uh, Apostle Paul says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. As we look at this prayer that Paul is praying, I want us to recognize that it's not just a prayer that we pray for ourselves, but it's also a prayer that we pray for one another, a prayer that we pray for other people in our life. And so today, this has not only a personal application, but also an application as we seek to pray for one another, certainly in a, a season and a time where a great prayer is needed. But if we're going to pray prayers that have eternal impact, uh, Paul gives us three bits of advice uh, in this passage. The first, he says, I keep asking. If I'm going to pray powerful prayers that have eternal impact, I have to keep asking. Uh, Jesus talked about this in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, ask, and it shall be given to you. Keep knocking, and the door shall be opened. Ask, seek, knock, and keep on asking, seeking, knocking. But perhaps you've wondered, if God knows what we need before we ask it, then why do we have to ask more than once? Why do we even have to ask once? If God already knows what I need, why doesn't he just give it to me? But the reason is God is interested in our praying over and over, not so much for what we get through our prayers, but for what happens in us through our prayers. God's goal isn't just to give us what, what we want or even what we need. God's goal is to change us to become more like Jesus Christ. And one of the ways he does that is through conversation with him. Uh, when we talk to him and listen to him in prayer, we become more and more like him. When you keep asking for something in prayer, a lot of times the request that you're making will change over time. Because as you interact with God in prayer, you become aware of him and you learn from him. And as a result, you begin to pray in a different way. You begin to pray in a wiser way. So Paul says, don't just ask once. Don't take God for granted and not ask at all but make prayer a living, relational experience. Keep asking. Second bit of advice that he gives us is that you need to clearly picture who you're praying to. When Jesus taught his disciples the Lord's Prayer, the first thing he said was, Our Father, who art in heaven. If you're going to pray effectively, you've got to picture in your heart and mind who it is that you're praying to. And that's what Paul does in his prayer in Ephesians. He says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, and he gives us a picture of the person we talk to when we pray. He says he's the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that phrase, it, it takes us back 
to the Old Testament where God said, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And when God used that phrase, he was saying, I'm the one who worked in the life of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And so as Paul writes this to us, he's saying the God of Jesus Christ is going to work in your life. When, when Jesus prayed, God did things. And Jesus prayed, broke bread, and passed out fish, and fed 5,000 men. One time, Jesus stood outside the tomb of his friend Lazarus, and he prayed to the Father, and then he called out, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus rose up and came out of the grave. I, I think it's important to note that Jesus specifically called Lazarus by name. If Jesus had just commanded, come forth, the whole cemetery would have rose up and emptied out, not just Lazarus. Paul says that's the God that we are praying to, the God of Jesus Christ. We're not just speaking words into the air when we pray. We're addressing a great and glorious and powerful God. That's important to remember who you're praying to. The third bit of advice is you have to know what you're praying for. You need to pray in specific ways for people to notice the, the end of the verse, for people to know him better, know Christ better. Seeing people grow in Christ is what church is all about. I'm so thrilled to hear Pastor Jeremy talk about the membership class and people stepping up and making those decisions and for them to be uh, growing in their faith. The, the most rewarding part of ministry for me is seeing Jesus Christ get a hold of a life and change it. It is so thrilling to see growth and life change in people. The saddest part of ministry is seeing people who could be growing but aren't growing. Seeing people with great potential for the Lord who are wasting that potential by rejecting God's offer of hope and healing. You know, I think that's true of the Lord, too. His greatest reward is seeing his children grow, and his greatest grief is seeing us not grow. So what's the solution? the end of Ephesians 1.17, Paul says, I pray that you may know him better. Christ's divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. We just need to get to know him better. And Paul takes time to pray in specific ways for people's growth. And I'd encourage you to do the same thing. People that you know, pray specific prayers for them. Pray by name. Pray that they would come to know him personally through salvation. This is one way that we pray a lot for people. We, we pray for people to come to know Christ personally, but we don't pray as much uh, for, for the next one, and that is that people would know him increasingly through spiritual growth and sanctification. Pray that Christians would know him increasingly, because it's God's desire not only that people get saved, it's also his desire that people grow in their faith, that people grow to become like Christ. That's the ultimate goal for all of us, to know him better, to become like Christ. And then we can pray that they would know him perfectly through glorification. You know, glorification happens automatically when you die. When, when we die, we will fully know Christ because we will see him fully revealed in all his glory, and we will be like him. And what a wonderful hope that we can pray for people, that one day they will see Christ in his glory and become like him. But our focus right now is praying for people to know him better through salvation and through spiritual growth, through sanctification is the theological term. So how do we do that? We need to pray for God's Spirit to give people wisdom and revelation. But God's Spirit has a real ministry in our lives. In Isaiah 11, 2, the Bible speaks prophetically about the Spirit's work in Jesus Christ's life and ministry. 
It says, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus and in our lives. He gives us wisdom. He gives us understanding. He gives us counsel. He gives us power. He gives us knowledge. He gives us the fear of the Lord. The number one thing to pray for as we pray for believers to grow is to pray for God to reveal to Christians what they already have in Christ. You know, most of our prayers can focus on what I don't have. Lord, I, I don't have enough energy. Lord, I don't have enough patience. Lord, I don't have this. I don't have that. We pray out of a sense of lack. But Paul prayed that people would see what they already had in Christ. He didn't ask God to give us what we do have. He asked God to reveal to us what we already have in Christ. Seeing that what we have in Christ is the answer to our needs. If those are the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ, well, how does this work with material resources? What, what if I truly need things like food, clothing, rent money? As we ask God to reveal to us what we already have, we're starting from the inside and working to the outside seeing things found inside with the eyes of our heart. God starts with our attitude, and then he moves to our outside. When you're worrying about an external situation or an external problem, but there's something wrong on the inside of you, if you try to meet the need yourself instead of depending on God, there's a barrier that you can't break through, and the need just isn't met. But when you start with your heart, if you say, Lord, instead of depending on myself, I'm depending on you, it's like the walls come down and the need is met. Well, what's happening there? God takes care of our insides first, and then he works on our outside. That's how he works in our lives. So start by asking God to reveal what you already have in Christ. We can see how this works in verse, verses 18 and 19. There, there are three ways here to focus your prayers on creating a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. We, Paul gives us three prayers that you and I can pray, not just for ourselves, but for other people. Paul says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened in order that you may know. Uh, when was the last time you had your eyes examined? Uh, this portion of Ephesians is like a spiritual eye chart. It helps me to diagnose my spiritual eyesight. Am I seeing things from my point of view? Am I seeing things from the world's point of view? Or am I seeing things from God's point of view? It all centers around the eyes of your heart. Second Kings 6 tells the story of the prophet Elisha and his servant, who are surrounded by an invading army. And Elisha's servant panics when he sees this great army. But Elisha says, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. But the servant the servant could see the physical enemy army surrounding them, but he couldn't see the spiritual army surrounding them on their behalf. And so Elisha prays on behalf of his servant. He says, oh, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked, and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Elisha won the battle that day because there were more of God's angels with him than there were soldiers with the enemy. Wouldn't it be great if God would do that for us? Sometimes you feel surrounded by difficult circumstances, surrounded by people who don't share your faith and values. 
surrounded by enemies of the cause of Christ. Sometimes you just feel overwhelmed. What a difference it would make if we were to pray, oh Lord, open my eyes to see things in a different way. You know, God does something amazing for modern day Christians. And he does it again from the inside out. The chariots of fire that he showed that servant in the Old Testament he had to show him these things visibly so he could have confidence. But because the Holy Spirit lives in believers today, God can bring that same confidence into our lives without having to see all the angels. Sometimes I'll hear people say, I, I wish I lived in Old Testament times when we could see angels and, and hear God's voice out loud. But the truth is, they only saw or heard from God every hundred years or so. And then it was only one guy in a million who got to see him. We have it today as believers much, much better, because every one of us who trusts in Christ is indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Our confidence comes from within us. It comes from the inside, not from what we see on the outside. When it says the, the eyes of your heart, heart is an important word. When we think of the heart, we think of where our emotions are. But that wasn't true in biblical days. When they talked about the heart, they were talking about the place where you would think and decide. It has more to do with your will than with your emotions. And Paul's talking about how you, you think about life, what you decide about life. The eyes of our heart set the direction of our lives. What you see with the eyes of your heart determines what you do. You know, the world that we live in often determines what we do. The, this world that we live in can seem so real to us, but honestly, it's not as real as the spiritual realm surrounding us. And so Paul prays that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so you can see past all the temporary activity that's happening here on earth and see the eternal things happening in the spiritual realm. We, we, we need to develop our spiritual eyesight. In Matthew 13, 13, Jesus talks about those people who rejected him. People who saw Jesus walk on water and calm the sea. They saw him heal the blind and the lame. They saw him raise people from the dead, and yet they rejected him. Why? Jesus said they see, but they don't really see. They hear, but they don't really hear or understand. The eyes of their hearts weren't open. That's why we, we need to look at God's eye chart, because God's eye chart not only helps us evaluate our vision, it also helps us correct our vision. Paul says there are three specific things that I need to pray for in my life and in the lives of other people. Number one, I pray that you'll know the hope to which he has called you. The key is to understand that hope comes from God's promises. Hope comes from trusting in God's promises. If all you have is this world, you'll either live in denial or in despair. There are people who live in denial. They look at the world and say, well, everything's going to be okay. Everything isn't going to be okay in this world. You can count on it. There are evil, hurtful people in this world. Bad things happen to good people in this world. No matter how much you insulate yourself or isolate yourself, you can't escape that. So you need a source of hope that's outside of this world. There are people who instead of living in denial, they live in despair. They don't know where we came from. They, they think we evolved from some primordial pool of slime and they don't know where we're going. They think we're headed for a cataclysmic doomsday. They don't know where we came from. They don't know where we're headed. We didn't evolve from some pool of slime. We began in the mind of God. God created us. And we're not going to end up in some cataclysmic destruction. 
those who trust in Jesus Christ are going to end up in a glorious eternity with God. That's God's promise to us. Because of that, Christians can see things in a different way. We can see the hope of his calling. We've got the hope of salvation in his son. We've got the hope of close fellowship with God. We've got the hope of the fruit of his spirit. Secondly, we need to see the riches of God's inheritance, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Now, notice whose inheritance we're talking about. It's not our inheritance. It's God's inheritance in his holy people. If I say I've got an inheritance in the bank, then you know that's my inheritance and you know where it's located. If I say God has an inheritance in his holy people, that means it's God's inheritance and it's located in us. We we are God's inheritance. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. God owns every star in the universe. God owns a billion planets. What is it in all of creation that God doesn't own? There's one thing he decided not to own when he created this world. He decided not to own our ability to choose. He could have owned that. He could have made us all robots but he decided that he wouldn't own our wills, our freedom to choose. So God's inheritance is our choice. When I say to Jesus Christ, I believe in you. When I say to God, I want you to be my heavenly father. Then I, as his child, am giving to God his rightful inheritance. It's my will and it's my choice. Look at Paul's description of this inheritance. He says, I pray that you will see the riches of his glorious inheritance. You, you are a rich inheritance for God. God looks at you and your choice to come to Jesus Christ and says, that makes me rich. You're a glorious inheritance to God. Don't let the world tell you anything different. You are of tremendous value to God. We see the hope of his calling. We see the richness of God's inheritance. And there's a third thing that we should pray for, and that is that we can see his incomparably great power for us who believe. And here, Paul strings together four Greek words that all mean power in some way or another. He uses the word dunamis, and that's where we get our word dynamite. He uses the Greek word energeia. That's where we get our word for energy. He uses the Greek word kratos. We get our word mighty from that. He uses the word iskus. That means power or greatness. Paul is telling us that God's power is unimaginable. You can't even imagine how big the power is that God has available for our lives. In order to see this power, you've got to have spiritual vision. In the second half of Ephesians 1.19, Paul gives us a picture of it. He says, that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. <clears throat> if you want a picture of the power God makes available to you, Look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The same kind of power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that power is available for my life and your life today. That's the kind of power that we have as believers. If you look at the world around you, where does it look like the seats of power are? The prime minister, the parliament, the banks, the army? God says, no, see with your heart's eyes. See the power that's in Christ, and Christ is in you. That's where the real power is. That's where the superpower of this world is. It's in Christ who lives in us. But it's not an obvious power. You can't see it as much in this world. It, it doesn't have tanks that roll over people. It doesn't issue edicts and lockdowns and quarantines, the, the kind of thing that, that 
puts you on the news. But this is the power that makes an eternal impact. When you sit down and talk to someone and you realize that they have a need and you say, I wish you knew my God. I wish you had my hope. I wish you had the power I have. I wish you had the joy that I have. God's power is at work in you and through you. And then that person comes to know Christ and begins to grow in Christ. And you have made an eternal difference in that person's life. That's the power of God working in our lives. If you want to understand this power, look at the resurrection of Christ. If you want to understand this power, look at the rule of Christ. Paul says Jesus Christ is far above all rule and authority, power and dominion. Those four words, rule, authority, power and dominion, are, are strung together a lot in Paul's writings. It, it has to do with the spiritual powers in the spiritual realm. And Jesus Christ is at the top, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. We need to look to heaven and recognize that Christ rules over everything. If you want to see this power, get involved with the church of Jesus Christ. The church is where the power of God is at work. Because God placed all things under his feet, and he appointed Jesus to be the head of everything for the church. The church is the place of God's power, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills everything in every way. The church is the body of Christ. Jesus is the head, we're the body. The church is the fullness of Christ. It's where his full will is made known. So how's your spiritual vision? Are you a little nearsighted, looking more at yourself or the circumstances around you than at the Lord? Some of you are probably farsighted. You, you see the blessings of God as way out in the future somewhere. Some of you are probably short-sighted. You just can't see that kind of power being at work in your life. But the truth is, Jesus Christ wants to work his power in your life. And that power comes into your life when you believe in Christ, when you seek the spirit of wisdom and revelation, when you keep asking in prayer, when you clearly picture who you're praying to, when you know what you're praying for, when you see the hope of his calling, when you see the riches of God's inheritance, and when you see the power available to you as God's child. Let me pray for you. God, I would pray that indeed you would open all our spiritual eyes to the great, great blessings that you have in store for us. And God, that you would move us to keep on asking, seeking, knocking, to pursue your power, your presence with a passion. We thank you for the hope we have in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.